you have trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation. But have you ever wondered if your faith was genuine? Are there times when you lay awake at night wondering if, even now, if everything is okay between you and God? If that's true, you're not alone, and you will want to listen in on this week's conversation from the book of James. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkis, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of James by looking at James chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. If you have a Bible handy, turn to James chapter 2, verses 25 to 26, as we join their final discussion on genuine faith. Hey, this uh, may be an easy question, uh, Vicki, Nathan, but if you happen, do you happen to know how the ancients and even some people today determined if a gold colored metal they were handed was actually genuine or fake? Well, I've heard of a way. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if it works or not, but I've heard <laughs> they, they bite the coin because gold is a soft metal. And if, if you can pun- not puncture it, but leave teeth marks in it, and not unlike my little brother's arm when I was a kid. And then, <laughs> <laughs> Confession's then, good for the soul, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you've you've got real gold. Now yeah. I don't know if that's true or not because I'm thinking about you know those chocolate gold coins. <laughs> 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 you can do that to those and leave teeth marks. So you know. But yeah. both of those things, I don't think, are approved by dentists, Vicky. Biting into <laughs> I soft metals and biting into chocolate. Or brother's arms. <laughs> or yeah. brother's arms. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> no, but I am told that when the purer the gold is, then the softer it is. So if people wanted to know, a quick and easy test would be to actually bite in it. And if you could leave a mark, then it was they could be fairly confident it was the real thing. And what I find interesting is that ancient test of genuineness, I think, could be applied in a somewhat similar fashion to our faith, not by biting your brother, but um, (laughs) by by seeing if the uh, marks that uh, James says are to be true of genuine faith are true of us. I mean, for the past few weeks, we have taken note of James' warning in chapter two of his book, verses 18 and 19, when he said, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. (laughs) Some were trying to say faith was enough and James is saying, no, you've got to have faith marked by deeds. Just intellectual assent isn't good enough. That's why in verse 19, he says, you believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. No, we need to make sure we've got a genuine faith that is marked by certain definite characteristics. So what are these deeds, these actions that prove our faith is genuine? Well, James in this passage mentions three. And if you've been with us the past few weeks, you'll remember in verses 14 through 18, he said that the first was a selfless service of others. That when we come to those in need, not like a shopkeeper hoping to make a profit, but to simply be a blessing to others, any thought of yourself, that's a mark of God. People see God in you when that happens. And last week we saw the, from the example of Abraham in verses 20 through 24, that even as Abraham was willing to obey God, when asked to do the most difficult thing imaginable, sacrifice his only son Isaac, He showed that his primary loyalty is to the Lord. And and James says of that, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? His faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. So that was really the second mark of genuineness that James mentions when it comes to faith. 
But today we come to the third and final mark that James is going to mention. And he does so, most of it is just in a single verse. In James chapter 2, verse 25, we read, In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? One of the challenges we face is that you may remember that this whole book was written for uh, Jewish Christians who were being separated and scattered because of persecution. But they were Jewish Christians. They are raised in the Old Testament. So they knew the Old Testament stories cold. So when James just drops that little nugget and said, no, like Rahab, that everyone was clued right in. But that's not us. Vicki, would you mind just giving us a little bit of context to understand what in the world's going on here with this allusion to Rahab? Sure, I'll tell you this story. Sunday school teacher that I have been. Um, <laughs> the Israelites were finally going to get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. Between where they were camped and the promised land, there was Jericho. Joshua was their leader. There's their camp. There's a river. There's Jericho, promised land. Picture mm -hmm. that. Their mm -hmm. camp, a river, Jericho, promised land. They yeah. can't get to the promised land without going through that river and without going through Jericho. So they, they have heard, oh, and Jericho was like this enormous, enormous, it's still big. Even though it fell down, you can still see the ruins. And this is thousands of years later. Yep, if yep. you go there, you'll still see ruins from there. Big, big, big fortress city. Joshua sends two spies in. Go through the river, go to Jericho, and they go to a prostitute's house, which <laughs> if you're, I know, I know, if you're reading it and you're a kid, you don't think anything about it because they say a woman who makes bad decisions. I'm reading it thinking, <laughs> I wonder if they knew where they were. I wonder why they <laughs> chose that place. But anyway, that's where they end up. <laughs> And they, they spy around, and she knows that they're Christians. She tells them that she will hide them. I, I don't remember the exact order of this, but the king finds out that they're there. Well, he wants them dead. So... He sends somebody there and and says, I understand you've got these these spies here. And she goes, oh, I did have spies here, but they've left. Go quickly. As soon as the city gates started to close, they left. Go fast. You can catch them. Lying her head off. So <laughs> then she, she runs in, finds them, and takes them up to the roof. And she's got a bunch of flax up there, flax, wheat, that kind of stuff. And she buries them under the flax, and they spend the night up on the roof under this flax. Well, the next day, she lowers them down by this red cord, this long red cord that she has and she obviously lives off the city wall because they mm -hmm. can scale down, they can rappel down, go back over the river, go back to the camp. But before they leave, she makes a deal with them. She goes, hey, I am saving your life. I risk my life. I saved your life. I want you to do something for me. I have heard about your God. And then she tells about two things she's heard their God do. I can't remember what the two things are, but she knew that Jehovah was really God. And she uses this phrase and she uses it twice. She said, when we heard, what was it? Can't remind me. Was it going through the Red Sea? Yep. The, uh, how he rescued you through the Red Sea and killed the Egyptians. You killed these two kings and you, you, God opened up the Red Sea for you. When we heard that, it melted our hearts with fear. She used that expression twice. And so 
she she heard that and she didn't just think, ooh, that's scary stuff. She thought, that is the true God. So she said, I believe in your God. You guys are going to take us. And so when you come back to wipe us out, I'm asking you because I spared you, you spare me. And here's what I didn't get as a kid. It wasn't just <laughs> spare me. It was spare me and my entire house. And I thought it was like her and her husband and her kids. Well, she's a prostitute. She didn't have right. a husband, but she's got a mother. She's got a father. She's got sisters. She's got brothers. They've yeah. got children. So it's like this big gaggle of people. And so they go, absolutely, we will do that. Because of what you've done, we will save you. But they say, gather them all together. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to go find all those people. They Name don't say tags. all that, but that's what they say, basically. <laughs> get them all in your house. If they're not in your house and they get wiped out, that's not on us. That's on you. So she agrees to that. And so then they scale down the wall and they they go. And then they come back and they wipe out. In fact, they don't just wipe out the city. That's, you know, <laughs> you were singing it earlier, Nathan. Joshua they fought the battle, the battle of Jericho, Jericho. Jericho. <laughs> Jericho. And he didn't fight any battle. He just circled the city and blew ram's horns. And the walls the came tumbling down. The walls came tumbling down. And the right. walls came down. <laughs> and they were able to, the walls didn't like totally like go down to dust. There's still walls standing like I told you. I've seen them. But they were able to rappel down and her entire family was saved. Yeah. It's an amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing story. I mean, it's uh, one of my favorites. I love the idea that, you know, Joshua sent in these two spies. You realize they were not the Mossad. Uh, they were not uh, trained. They've been wandering in the wilderness for their whole life. They get up there. It looks like they got spotted immediately. Um, immediately. They, ran, <laughs> they ran for cover and ended up in a prostitute's house. I don't think that was well planned. I mean, it's God's sovereignty was there, but I, but I don't think that was part of any strategy. And they run into the only religious prostitute ever. in the whole area. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> she ever. read in the newspaper. She she read about events that Israel had lived through, and and Israel had a trouble believing God would would help them. But this woman reads in the newspaper what happened a few years before, and and she's committing her life to God, and she is because she put everything at stake. Her whole family was at stake. If she got caught, everyone's gone. And when you think about that, she was willing to give up her loyalty to her country. She was willing to abandon her cultural heritage in exchange for knowing the God of Israel. I mean, that is huge. And that's why James says this, this is faith at work. This is genuine faith. If you are willing to follow God's leading beyond your own culture, if you're willing to give up your neighborhood, your community, your heritage, and then you know that your God's faith is at work in your life. That doesn't mean he's going to lead you there, but should he lead you there, would you follow? <laughs> It's easy to talk about in the abstract, but but guys, what would you find difficult if God suddenly said he wanted you to go to Thailand, Russia, or Kenya? Not, not for vacation, but to call home hmm. because that's the best place you could serve him. What would you miss? What would make it that difficult? You don't even have to be that hard. I mean, I, I was in Southern California for, for five years and God <laughs> called me to Northern Michigan. We do not have an in and out burger here. Oh. <laughs> so, well, you sure know suffering. That's a so the, you know, the food that we've had to give up and, uh, and you know, I moved from uh, paradise climate to uh, snow six months out of the year. Uh, you know, it's kept the muscle mass up, but... Uh, <laughs> Got to shovel that uh, snow. But seriously, you know, the, the food is different. The um, mm -hmm. uh, But if I was to go somewhere even further, you've got language barriers. I remember being a young man telling God specifically, I will serve you wherever you want me to go as long as they speak English. Right. It's, um, it is a difficult thing to have to be able to, to be willing to give up our culture, 
to embrace a different culture, to value our relationship with God more than the comfort of our own community, mm. that's hard. Yeah. Exchanging cultures, though, is not an unusual display of faith. I mean, if you think about it, I think we mentioned last week that God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees. That was like, you know, the, the best city of his day, the educational financial hub to go to a land I will show you. I'm not even going to tell you where, just wander in the desert. And, uh, and he left everything behind. Ruth made that same kind of commitment when she turned from her Moabite culture and gods and said, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will now be my people and your God, my God. Think of Paul. His, the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys took him to a multitude of different countries and cultures. And he was willing to sacrificially adapt to each one in the service of his Lord. Jesus told his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And think for a moment how the Father sent his son, Jesus. And John Stott, one of my heroes, uh, our heroes, um, generation past, uh, showed great insight into this. Yeah, I deeply, deeply appreciate John Stott and much of the work that he has done uh, throughout the decades and the ministry he's done just uh, through his books in my life. And, and he wrote this uh, talking about uh, giving up everything uh, or, or giving up in order to follow Christ. He says, the Son of God did not stay in the safe immunity of his heaven. He emptied himself of his glory and humbled himself to serve. He became little, weak, and vulnerable. He entered into our pain, our alienation, and our temptations. He not only proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God, but demonstrated its arrival by healing the sick, feeding the hungry, forgiving the sinful, befriending the dropout, and raising the dead. He had not come to be served, he said, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom price for the release of others. If the Christian mission is to be modeled on Christ's mission, it will surely involve us entering into other people's worlds, their thought worlds, and the world of their tragedy and lostness in order to share Christ with them where they are. It will mean a willingness to renounce the comfort and security of our own cultural background in order to give ourselves in service to people of another culture whose needs we may never before have known or experienced. Incarnational mission necessitates a costly identification with people in their actual situations. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Mm. To know that Jesus came and pitched his tent among us. I mean, he's not only among us and not in heaven. He's living in a tent compared to where he was from. And that is our model. And that's one of the demonstrations of saving faith because Christ is in us and he's changing us and we radiate him. We see that in Rahab. Even though she was a babe in the faith, <laughs> uh, lots of things were wrong with her, but her trust in the God of Israel was greater than her love for her own culture. I guess the question I got to ask is, is ours, is yours? Is your faith strong enough for you to step out of your comfort zone and embrace other people of other cultures for the cause of Christ? A pivotal moment in my life as a teenager was when I was in a church and the preacher was, was a missions conference. And he was preaching and wasn't the world's greatest preacher, but he was one of the world's best pastors. And he looked down at that congregation. I thought he was looking just at me. And he said, are you willing to say that you'll go wherever God wants you to go? And I thought to myself, yeah, I think I will. And then he said, if you are, open up your Bible to the fly leaf. And I dare you to write, here I am, Lord, send me. You write that down as your promise of the Lord, and you put that date. And downstairs right now is that old Bible. It's in tatters, but I kept it because that was a defining moment in the development of my faith. Huh. Wow. For the past three weeks, 
we've been examining what does it mean to have genuine faith? We better have genuine faith because the Christian faith is based in on faith. It is faith. By faith, we are saved, but it better be the real thing. And how do we know if our faith is genuine? Here in this passage, James has showed us, we know it's genuine if we selflessly serve others, if our primary loyalty is to our Lord, and if we have a faith that follows Rahab's and Christ's example, and for God's sake, are willing to give up even our culture for him. One final comment. James is not inviting us to pick and choose one of the three that we like the most. It is the presence of all three that confirms the genuineness of our faith. And if this frightens you, then maybe our prayer should be the same as the man who cried out to Jesus. I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And one final request, whatever you do, take this seriously, because the consequences of living with fake faith are eternally frightening. As James points out in verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. What about you? Would you be willing to follow God's leading to a place or to a people you might not like? That's the mark of genuine faith. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on social media and telling your friends. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the book of James and discover God's high standards for preachers. Be sure to join us.